So it is time for this week's Outsider. My mystery guest is a world-class former heptathlete. Now, she holds a trio of Olympic medals, but it took 10 years to receive two of the three. Now, she was one bronze outright in Athens in 2004, but bagging the next two medals was more complicated as she finished fifth <coughs> Sorry, in the heptathlon and the 4 by 400 metre relay. But then it emerged later that her competitors had not been playing by the rules and that she'd been beaten by drugs, cheats. And since missing out on the podium moments and being retrospectively awarded two bronze medals, she's been team leader of England's athletics team for the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. Uh, any guesses? Well, I'm pleased to say that I'm joined now by Kelly Sotherton, MBE. Kelly, thank you so much for joining me, Crikey. Well, so <laughs> Kelly, talk to me. <clears throat> Sorry. You, you, you're, you're a fantastic athlete, but a lot of people might not know much about your backstory. So talk to me about, you know, what, what brought you to athletics? And, um, you know, so many, you know, when you're doing so many events, how can you end up being good at any of them? It's like master of all, jack of all trades and master of none, but obviously not for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, good afternoon, Nana. Um, basically, um, I was one of those kids at school that most people probably hate. Um, I was good at everything, um, pick first for the teams, and I just had a natural ability and affinity just to do sport, um, as well as being quite academic. Um, played netball, hockey, etc., all the way through school and athletics. Um, and it wasn't really until I went to university um, that I continued netball and athletics and started to really show my prowess in athletics. So netball got dropped um, and I just concentrated on athletics then. Um, and when I left university, um, I didn't go straight into the sport. So I wasn't like a traditional athlete who went to junior championships, etc. I wasn't really that good then. I was OK. It was just that I had... Uh, I had an opportunity and I was working for a bank at the time and I moved to Birmingham and um, somebody saw something in me and that somebody was the coach of Denise Lewis, who was then the, the Olympic mm. champion in heptathlon. And that was Charles Van Commenay. And he says, you've got something and I'd like to coach you. So with permission of my former coach, uh, Trevor at the time, Trevor Marseille sadly passed away, um, I linked up with uh, Denise and Charles. And then nine months later, after that linking up, I won an Olympic medal in Athens. So oh um, it's kind of a, a rags to riches story. Not that I was in rags, but it was kind of quick, but very late in my in my career, so to speak. So how old were you? Because a lot of people by sort of when they get into their sort of 20s will be thinking, oh, well, I've just got literally no hope. Um, I was I was 26 when I linked up wow. with Denise and Charles. I mean, I'd gone to the Commonwealth Games in 2002 in Manchester, but I still hadn't fulfilled any promise. I think I was like, I was okay. I was filling spaces on the team. Um, but I had, uh, I wanted to do more. And I knew I had something, but I just didn't know how to unlock it. And it was just, ha it was just had an opportunity and I just ran with it. And um, I had to give up my job. I, Charles was quite forced, was like, give up your job, be a full-time athlete and let's really take the ball by the horns and give it everything and I did and it changed the path of my life um in that short period of time I went from being 59th in the world to being number three very very wow. quickly um so it was just because I was able to dedicate that time to being a full-time athlete um so you know not everyone gets that opportunity but I did and it worked for me so a hep heptathlete how many events are those Seven. So you have four on one day, three the next. So it starts with 100 meter hurdles, then you do high jump, then shot put, then 200 meters. And then the next day we get up, um, body aching a little, and then you do long jump, javelin, and 800 meters. So oh. it's quite a tiring two days. It, it, and it's spread from like the first day starts usually at nine in the morning and can finish at 10 at night. Then you have to come back in the morning. Um, just long jump at nine or 10 in the morning, but the 800 could be 10 o'clock at night. So mm. at a championship, so it's very two long days and that's what makes it so tiring. You're making me feel tired just listening to you. <laughs> what, what, what's the one that you hate? What's the, I think it's the hurdles. Did you, you do hurdles, don't you? Do you have to do hurdles? Yeah, you heard it first. Her. And funnily enough, you probably could be right because it's the first event of the day and you yeah. need to get that right. So that's the one you're probably most nervous for. Um, and once that event is done and you've done okay then you can you know fit the other six in i mean a lot of people would have said that probably javelin wasn't my favorite mm. event because i wasn't so good at it but it 
yes, it caused a lot of stress. Um, yeah. But I, I enjoyed all seven. There was always something about each one that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And even the 800 meters, obviously, your heart's in your mouth all the way around because that, that one that hurt. But also it's at the end. And if you're good at it, and I was good at the 800, it, was, it wasn't so bad as it was for most other heptathletes who didn't enjoy mm. that event. That was my favourite race, actually, the 800. Uh, but the hurdles, I have just PTSD after bashing my knee on one of them. It's like, oh, <laughs> I hate the thought of them. They're the worst. I mean, they're yeah. just so painful. I don't know. It's just, you just got to jump over them just to make sure you don't get hurt on them. So talk to me yeah. about... Uh, the, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, I, in training, Anna, plenty of times I've hit my knee and that, you just learn not to. <laughs> yeah, you do after that. And you had to wait yeah. a couple of years to get a medal. Was it, was it 10 years or something you had to wait to get your, your medal? Well, talk to me about yeah, that. Yeah, so from Beijing, yeah, correct. So from Beijing, I was fifth and fifth, and then we was upgraded to fourth in the heptathlon because someone um, got caught out there. Um, and in our four by four, we finished fifth. Um, and then subsequently, like seven years later, eight years later, we heard that um, one of the Belarusians in the four by four had been disqualified. Um, and there was um, allegations over one of the Russian athletes who then had our samples tested back from Beijing. And she'd actually subsequently cheated Jessica Ennis out of a world title, oh two world titles, I think, at the time. Um, so, um, y yeah, she went to the Court of Arbitration of Sport, which took about a year. And then once that result came through and in my favour, or in favour of her losing her medal and me getting it, I got my medal, uh, one of them at the Olympic Stadium, which was great. That's the 4 by 4 with my teammates. Um, and then the heptathlon medal was at the Team GB Ball, Okay. That was celebrating Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Olympics. And nobody knew that was happening apart from a couple of people. So I got to have a really intimate medal ceremony dressed up. Um, oh, so you, you got a ceremony here. Yeah, because that, that would be the annoying yeah. bit. I'd be annoyed that I didn't get, didn't get the ceremony. But what about, what do you make of this? Because you're talking about cheating. And in my head, I'm thinking that when I see like, trans women in women's sport, I get quite angry at that. Um, you know, I have nothing against somebody who's trans. You know, it's up to you. I don't, it's not, not my business. But... I get really, really angry when I see trans women competing against women because they're, they're, they're not women in terms of biology, uh, which is sport is all about bodies. Surely, what was your view on all of that? Uh, first of all, I think a lot of people are very frightened, especially females in sport, to talk mm. out about this without being offensive or offending anybody. And rightly so, it, it is a tricky subject. I am all for fairness in sport, regardless of what gender you are. Um, I am for natural born females having their own category and it's female sport. Now the greater conversation is to incl be inclusive and diverse. How do we, how it's basically how does sport or society cater for a different category that isn't mm. the norm, I should say. Um, and so it's, that's the conversation. How do we accommodate transgender men and women in that, in that, in that category? I don't know the solution, but that's the conversation. Um, you know, when you see little girls uh, who who want to emulate their sports stars from whatever sport, tennis, uh, motor racing, athletics, swimming, whatnot, you know, if they're, and they're not starting on a level playing field, if they're going to be against, you know, a, a boy who's gone through pu puberty, because the, the advantages there are so great and the sciences have come up and shown that there is an advantage I just think the conversation needs to be around how do we deal in society and elite sport? Because this is recreational and elite. It's from top to bottom. How do we deal with it in society to make it fair and inclusive? And I don't have the answers to that, unfortunately. But I agree with you, Anna. It's, um, it's, a, tough, it's a tough subject that a lot of people don't like to talk about. And in this case, they offend or upset. Well, I'm all right with it. I don't see why they just can't have their own category. <laughs> yes. I, I, I don't see what the problem is. Have your own category because it's not fair on the women. Uh, or, or, yeah. You know, like there's no, you probably won't find uh, a trans man competing against men because that wouldn't make any sense. Because, uh, I mean, you never know, but it's unlikely that they would beat a, tra a man only because they are natural born women. So I, I don't see why people are having such a difficulty just having like a separate category for somebody, for trans athletes and one for women and men or an open category that you can, if you want to go in, you can. But I don't, I don't see why. I think it's. What's I think what the, the problem is, is that um, it's probably terminology and forgive me, I forget this wrong. So female women, we're in, we're male, female categories and transgender, transgender women. So it's like, are they transgender females or transgender women? And I have is obviously if you're going to use 
correct grammar, that's what it should be. I do think, though, what potentially this could open up for if, if there wasn't a separate category and transgender women were allowed mm. to compete in the female category, natural born females, I think you would probably end up seeing in a, in a generation or so's time the potential for maybe gender doping. I don't know that, you know, there's always so many connotations here that there's unscrupulous people in the world that might think a, this could be an advantage or a moneymaker. Mm. But it's just a, a discussion that needs to be had to have fairness inclusion for all. And yeah. I just don't feel there's been yeah. that sensible discussion. It seems so simple and um, to to say what you're saying, Anna, just go, yeah, this is. category is for transgender yeah. women. But it is. But yeah. I don't think it's actually all that simple. Why? Um, it sounds simple, it's... but it. I just don't, th I don't think it's that simple. However, I agree with you. I just think the wider discussion is how, how does that fit into society with recreational and elite sport? Because, you know, society has to reflect what's happening in the elite sport, what it should do. Um, mm. So it's making sure that's correct. I, I, you know, I generally don't see what the issue is. I think if you're a transgender woman, you can have a transgender woman category, you can have a woman category, and then you can have a man and you can have a trans man category. If, you know, you can make it fair for all rather than making it unfair for one, but inclusive in one way. By being inclusive doesn't mean that everyone's in the same space. It can mean that everyone has a space. That's all it is. It's not taking things out and, and not ha and, and being offensive to people. It just seems that people are tiptoeing around a, a very logical conclusion which they will come to in the end, but we're going to have all this furore about it until eventually somebody goes, let's have a separate category. I promise you. Mark yeah, my words. I think it's been, I think a lot of people have done that on social media and in the media and various articles over the last couple of years. Um, but for some reason, nobody seemed to have grasped that concept yeah. and it, it's just been quite kind of probably controversial in terms of obviously a sport or society or community banning the rights of a transgender woman to compete in a female category, which obviously, for fairness for women, that's what should happen. Yeah, but then not, put, but but then not have the solution of a category for them, transgender women to compete in. So it's like, sorry, you can't compete in anything. Well, they should so do, they should just do it the anyway. men's group. So if the solution mm. was another category, mm. let someone do another category to see how well that's received and accepted and what it looks like. At the mm. moment, we don't know what that really looks like. Mm. I've heard the argument that there won't be enough transgender people in it. That's why and it's like, well, they'd win anyway, usually against a woman, so they can just win their own race. It'd be fine. Listen, Kelly, what are you up to briefly? We're running out of time. So what's your next <laughs> thing then? <laughs> Hello, the cat. Sorry, it's my cat making Hello, uh, cat. their debut. Um, what am I doing? So I work for Sport England, actually, now. I work in talent coaching, so I help... Um, develop coaches and people of the future who work in the talent space um about 55 sports so um it's gone from team leader of being the most successful team in the commonwealth games in track and field which was brilliant role absolutely yeah great me and boris, <laughs> um, boris yeah, yeah had it. such a great it was a brilliant summer i was really proud to be because i live in birmingham so i was really proud to have that opportunity to lead my team at commonwealth games they were absolutely amazing and it was one of the most inclusive teams with the, the power athletes and able-bodied be able to compete together um, and it was a pleasure to lead them all um, but now we've moved on out of athletics and now oh, yeah. producing um, ho hoping to support as many more sports as possible to be to be greater at coaching um, and that's my well, aim at the moment my well team. You, you you keep doing your thing I know you've got an MB as well well <laughs> done Kelly fabulous lovely Thank to you. talk to you as Kelly, Kelly yeah, Sutherton she's an Olympic heptathlete MBE Kelly Sutherton thank you very much lovely to talk to you